Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to the Tribunal on Forced Labor in Political GDR Imprisonment. I'm a speaker at UOKG, the Union of Victims Association of Communist Tyranny, and I'm going to be your host during these three, uh, three days. Let me give you some preliminary information before we start. As you know, we are in the era of Corona, and this is why we're going to stick to the m social distancing Please keep your mask, your protective mask put. You can uh, take it off when you're outside. And uh, please treat each other with all due respect. We would have liked to seat everybody in the front, but unfortunately, this is not feasible. And please consider each other's needs. And I would like to inform you that we're going to have a live stream in here and uh, out there. Hello to everybody out there in the world. This is our premiere, and we are very excited to see how things are going to unfold. We're going to take pictures, and um, if you don't want your picture to be taken, please let us know. You all received folders when you came in with some in important information, the agenda, and uh, layout uh, where you find the bathrooms, they are in the foyer, and you can also help yourself to some beverages free of charge, water, coffee, and so you will be served there. So this is an international conference, and this is why we have simultaneous interpreters with us, and you have uh, headsets. In this room it's easy to switch it on, channel number one is German, and channel number two is English. If you have a problem, please raise your hand, wave, give our colleagues a sign. Sandra Czech and her team, most of you know her, I'm sure, uh, will be Please to answer your questions, and you can also ask me. With regard to our dinner later on, I'm going to give you some information later on. So this was it in terms of preliminary remarks, and we are going to start with some uh, words of greetings. We have three cooperation partners, and this is why we're going to hear six uh, introductory remarks. We're going to start with the federal chair of the UOKG, Mr. Dieter Dombrovsky. You've got the floor on behalf of the Union of Victims Associations of Communist Tyranny. Ja, meine Damen und Herren, Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, a very warm welcome to all of you. I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all those who have come from afar. In particular, Badanam from South Korea, and our friends of a U.S. foundation for the victims of communism, the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, and the managing director, Mr. Smith, is here, and he's going to speak to us later on. Uh, welcome, Ms. Pinerova from Prague, and these are the people who have come from very far to join us. Tomorrow we're going to start our conference with the hearings. We are going to introduce you to the members of our jury. Not everybody is here because they will start their ta task tomorrow and they will be introduced uh, individually. But I would like to welcome Dr. Matthias Barth, the head of the jury. He is a uh, prosecutor, a former public prosecutor. and. He is also a former political prisoner. This doesn't happen that often that you work uh, for the state as a prosecutor and you, at the same time you are a former prisoner of the GDR. So in many different ways he is a dedicated expert. I would like to thank all those at the start who co-organized this Congress and who also supported it financially, the federal government, the uh, State Minister for Culture, Ms. Gritters, and uh, the uh, tribunal sounds a little bit like accusation. And of course, when listening to the witnesses tomorrow, we are also going to deal with the German-German relations of the two German governments. And our federal government and the previous government will, of course, uh, get some bruises. But the nice thing about our 
democracy is that the way we see things and also according to the view of our um, parliamentary members of parliament, a critical dialogue is promoted and this is outstanding. And when thinking about Belarus, where we all look and it fills us with sadness when we see what happens there, and we hope that the men and women who take to the streets there will not be left of courage. I would also like to welcome Maria Noke, Commissioner for the Study of the Communist Dictatorship of the State of Brandenburg. And Ms. Neumann Becker, a very loyal companion and a quote activist, unquote, of the interests of the former SED victims. Ladies and gentlemen, the Union of Victims Associations of Communist Tyranny is the umbrella organization of about 40 victims associations of the SED dictatorship and communism. It is here in the former Cottbus prison that we are holding the Congress entitled Tribunal on Forced Labor during political imprisonment in the GDR. Why are we doing this? The variety of injustices committed by the SED dictatorship is almost limitless. The SED dictatorship had an impact on all areas of public and private life. At this Congress, we want to find out, with the help of witness statements to an international jury, whether legal and moral principles were, were violated during the forced labor of political prisoners in the former GDR. As a former prisoner in this prison, I naturally have an opinion on this, but this opinion is not relevant today because we want to have the investigation and evaluation to be carried out independently and objectively. In any event, we are of the opinion that this German-German chapter of forced labor of politically imprisoned people who were threatened by punishment and worked under very hard conditions must not be forgotten. About two years ago, we, the Union of Victims Association of Communist Tyranny, established an as a foundation association in which we want to collect money to help former political forced laborers in difficult situations. There are individual companies that were involved in the German-German trade in goods, which are willing to participate in a symbolic compensation or better support for these former forced laborers. Through this Congress, we also want to draw attention to this topic, and we are not talking about a fringe group here. In 40 years of GD the GDR, about 250,000 people were imprisoned for political reasons. I said it already, if, I, if we extrapolate this to the current population of our country, this would correspond, so to speak, to the innocent imprisonment of 1.2 million people. Fortunately, in our democratic constitutional state, we do not have to proceed to such calculations. But it shows, and it is also a small part of all the different areas of injustice that we cannot mention during these two days. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank all those who contributed to the success of this Congress, and I wish us all an interesting and fruitful meeting. I wish us all a very successful meeting, and I kindly ask the media, and this uh, will particularly be applicable tomorrow. I kindly ask the media to report on this event in a way that promotes our cause. Thank you very much. Mr. Dombrovsky, thank you very much for your words. And the next speaker will be Sylvia Wehling, the uh, managing director of the Human Rights Center in Cottbus. Please come up to the front. I haven't said anything, thank you, yet. <laughs> Dear former prisoners, cooperation partners and guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Cottbus Human Rights Center, I would like to welcome you to the Cottbus Prison Memorial. We are pleased that we, together with our umbrella organization, the Union of Victims Association of Communist Tyranny, and our partner human rights organization, the IGFM, are able to hold the tribunal forced labor during GDR imprisonment on our premises, and we thank the Federal Commissioner for Culture and Media, Professor Monika Grütters, for your financial support. This hall we are in 
was used by the state-owned VEB Pentagon of the Dresden-based company VEB Pentagon as a punching shop or stamping shop until 1990. Since in 1990, VEB Pentagon was liquidated by the Treuhandanstalt and production was no longer located here. You can assume that the hand uh, fingerprints and oil stains on the soundproofing panels around us, as well as the smell of oil rising from the floor and filling the room, are original from the decades before 1989. You can see these stains on the wall on the left-hand side. If the hall is to be renovated in the future, it is important that these testimonies of work from an earlier period are preserved as a reminder. This weekend, we will hear from numerous contemporary witnesses about inhuman working conditions, lack of occupational safety and hygiene regulations. I will let the former prisoner, Walter Schmidt, tell us briefly what he experienced in this very room during his imprisonment in the mid-1970s. A prisoner had cut off a finger. And it was a clean cut, no blood whatsoever. There were a lot of doctors imprisoned. The doctor said that with a cut like that, there was actually no problem sewing the limb back on. But the limb that had been cut had to be cooled immediately and the victim had to be taken to the nearest surgical clinic as quickly as possible. It might even be possible that the limb would later on be functional again. Well, of course, nothing happened in Cottbus. At first, the prisoner sat there unprovided for and sat there and sat there. His finger lay on the machine where he had cut it off, and it stayed there until someone later disposed of it. And then, after hours, the prisoner was driven to the prison hospital in Le to Leipzig, Moisdorf, on a prisoner transport. And there he was cared for. He got a bandage, and that was it. I can't say it exactly, but I would say that a week later he was back with a bandaged hand and had to continue working. Did the penal system overlook such and similar incidents and accidents, of which there were disproportionately many in the penal institution of the GDR compared to civilian life? Only a few meters further behind us, VEB Spreller had the prisoners manufacture bushings, mostly for the automotive industry. Prisoner Christian Koch remembers from his time in prison in the mid-1970s as follows. The room was shrouded in a dense mist of fine plastic dust. And the closer you came to the machines, the denser this cloud of dust became around the workplace. We had to sweep every evening. Evening. By then, one and a half, a half a centimeter of fine dust had settled out of the air. So in this dense dust fog, we stood in the Spreller Hall and had to unscrew plastic pipes. It is worthwhile letting the head of the prison's department in the GDR Ministry of the Interior, Colonel Lustig, speak and hear what he says about such conditions. From November 3rd to 12th, 1976, he visited the uh, penitentiary facility for inspection and wrote a report from which the following judgment was taken. The cooperation with the companies that use the labor to ensure health and occupational safety and to comply with hygienic norms is inadequate. The members of the employing companies pay little or no attention to this responsibility. Examples of this are the unhygienic conditions in the sanitary facilities and washing facilities for the prisoners, as well as the non-compliance with occupational health and safety regulations, such as the wearing of hearing, protect hearing aids, hearing protection, excuse me, and glasses, and the improper storage of material in the pentacon section of the plant. Up to now, little or no consideration has been given to comments and complaints by the medical service of the prison. What a scathing 
verdict for their own people. This is just a small foretaste of what we will be dealing with this weekend. I wish and hope that the jury on Sunday will come to the conclusion that the work done in the prisons of the GDR was not only prohibited forced labor. 30 years after the German reunification, it is about time that people are compensated for the injustice they suffered. If a person has been re or was re rehabilitated as a political prisoner, if that was possible, and if there was compensation from the state for this, there should have been a compensation for the work done unjustly. In our exhibition, Prison Force Labor in the Cottbus Prison from 1933 to 1989, on the second floor of the memorial, you can read more moving statements, insights, and information about forced labor in Cottbus. On Sunday morning, you will have the the opportunity to learn more about the Cottbus Human Rights Center during the guided tour. And now, I wish you an interesting conference. Our staff will be happy to answer your questions. And please observe the distant and hygiene regulations. Thank you very much. Dear Sylvia, thank you very much. The next speaker is our representative of our second corporation partner, Mr. Karl Hafen, the former managing director and chairman of the International Society for Human Rights, IGFM. Welcome. I would like to convey you the greetings, the greetings of the International Society for Human Rights based in Frankfurt on the Main. Why should we today, 30 years after the fall of the wall and the reunification of Germany, speak again about prison conditions and conditions of imprisonment and about forced labor in GDR prisons, in particular the chapter on direct persecution and subsequent imprisonment for political reasons in the GDR has been closed by most people. But just now, as we are witnessing how people are fighting for their freedom in Belarus and are rebelling against a regime that continued to use political imprisonment as applied by the Soviet Union as a means of oppression today and brought thousands into prisons, well, this is why our topic is more topical today than ever. And one thing must be remembered, forgetting is not a way of coping with history and not of coming to terms with it. We have to thank those who have used their personal freedom for the benefit of general freedom. They are the pioneers of reunification. They were the living signs of dissatisfaction and resistance against the GDR system, which tried to hold on to power with injustice, violence, control, deception, and unfairness. Today, former political prisoners generally live as, unrecogni as unrecognized beside us as former perpetrators, followers, and all those who watched and remained silent. What is different for them is the experience of imprisonment and the preceding persecution with a whole range of concomitant circumstances such as the destruction of families and friendships, careers setbacks that are still not, have still not been overcome even today due to lower pensions, humiliation, damage caused by imprisonment, loss of trust in friends and justice and other disadvantages. Much has been uncovered and uh, worked through in the process, processing of the Stasi files, and for most people, this is already enough as satisfaction to see confirmed today what they had suspected at the time already. But still, many people, including members of the German Bundestag, refuse to name and refuse to name and accept this injustice as part and to admit their complicity. And this applies not only to politicians born in the East, but also to those born in the West. The Federal Republic of Germany commissioned the Central Registration Office in Salzgitter to register the human rights crimes in the GDR, and it interviewed former GDR prisoners who had been brought free by means of a questionnaire. But it was not until 1982 that the Inner German Committee of the German Bundestag dealt with the conditions of imprisonment in the GDR in public session and listened to the oral reports of former political prisoners. The Stenographic Protocol, number 36 of the 17th Committee of September 8, 1982, was quickly out of print. At the request of the International Society for Human Rights, the then chairman of the Inner German Committee, Gerhard Redemann, wrote to us 
In July 1986, that he saw no urgent need for repetition at the moment. The IGFM took this answer as an opportunity to reappraise this sad chapter for a broad public and to review it in order to inform the population, open the eyes of young people and to raise their willingness to help. Following a hearing of former political prisoners, we issued two publications, Human Rights in the GDR and East Berlin and Political Prison in the GDR. In both, we devoted a separate chapter to the topic of forced labor and had former political prisoners of the GDR describe their experience, 25 at the time that we interviewed. We distributed these documentations in large numbers in schools at the German Bundestag and at info information stands and used them in English, French and Spanish translation at CSCE follow-up conferences and as an informal basis for a 1503 collective complaint against the GDR at the United Nations. I see today's event as a con continuation of our work at the time with the difference that today we are gathering at a place of action, the Cottbus Prison Memorial, and it is here that we want to get a picture of how political prisoners were integrated into the GDR's production process under threat of punishment such as isolation and other measures, and how they were exploited in circumvention of occupational safety and health care, including for the production of export goods commissioned by the Federal Republic of Germany. Forced labor by political prisoners was a reality. No one should make excuses for not knowing. Thank you very much. Dear Mr. Hafen, thank you very much for these words. Now I would like to ask our far travel guest, Marion Smith, the managing director of our third corporation partner. The Victims of Communism Foundation, please. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you'll forgive me for speaking in English, uh, but I do intend to learn German uh, right after I have mastered the difficult language of Hungarian, and so I expect that's going to be in a few decades. Why Hungarian? Because I am married to a Hungarian. Um, and despite my intellectual and principled opposition to communism for all that it destroys, I have gained a sense of the personal side of those who suffered under communism through my wife's family. Because her grandparents lived in a small German-speaking town in the east part of Hungary, and following World War II, the Soviets came in and loaded up all the German speakers in that province and told them to pack for three days. They were going on a small work trip. They came back on foot several years later, uh, the victims of forced labor as part of the Soviet system. So for that reason and many others, it's an honor to be with all of you in Cutpus this evening. And on behalf of the Board of Trustees of the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation and our many patrons in the United States, I want to thank you for convening uh, this conference and tribunal. It is vitally important that we have not only a moral reckoning for the crimes committed by communist regimes, but also a form of legal accountability. Our organization was authorized by the United States Congress 26 years ago in the wake of the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of communism in Europe, our mission is to spread understanding uh, about the grave crimes perpetrated by those who sought to enact the ideology and the programs of Marx, Lenin, Stalin, Mao, and many other communist ideologues and, and despots. Ideas have consequences. And every day we strive to remind the world that communism is the most vicious idea in human history, one that has murdered, enslaved, and ruined more lives than any other by a massive margin. It has already killed more than 100 million women, men, children, infants, and unborn. It has already dominated more than 2 billion lives for more than a century. More people live under a single-party communist dictatorship today than ever before. More people suffer under communist tyranny now 
than during the Cold War. The hardest part of my job is listening to the stories. A North Korean mother forced to watch her children starve to death. Seeing the scars of a Chinese man in my office who was tortured in a re-education camp because of his religious faith. A brave Cuban woman whose left arm was chopped off in an attack all because she tried to keep the small school in her village open for the children of her village. Everywhere I go, I listen to these stories, which is why I'm here with you today and for the next few days. In fact, all of us are here to hear the stories of the victims of communism. We'll hear from those who witnessed or endured the forced labor that defined, for many, the German Democratic Republic. We'll hear what it was like for the more than 200,000 political prisoners who were sent into the fields, the mines, and the factories. Many were housed in this very prison, which was the largest facility for political prisoners in the GDR. We'll hear about the crimes they saw, the pain they felt, and the scars they carry to this day. But we are not only here to listen. We came to this place to act. We seek one thing, one simple word, and that is justice. This year marks the 30th anniversary of East Germany's reunification with the West, and sadly, over three long decades, the wrong that the communist rulers perpetrated have not been righted. We face the threat of collective amnesia as the perpetrators are becoming forgotten, and so too are the victims. Yet those of us here have no intention of letting this happen. We're here to say that we will remember those victims in East Germany. The pursuit of justice must start with shining a light on injustice. And so today we ask ourselves, and over the next few days, what happened in this place? What happened across the German Democratic Republic as a whole? And the sad truth, of course, is that forced labor was widespread. From its founding in 1949 to its fall in 1990, the GDR was not the only regime, of course, that relied on forced labor. So did the Nazi regime that preceded it and the Soviet regime that controlled it. The Nazis systematically enslaved ethnic groups across Central and Eastern Europe, affecting at least 12 million people. In the Nazi network of concentration camps, forced labor often preceded extermination. As for the Soviets, they built their own system, a network of su suffering and servitude known as the Gulag. At least 18 million people were sent there, and at least one and a half million people died there. It was never a question of whether or not forced labor would come to East Germany. It was just a matter of when. Like the national socialism of the Nazi state, the international socialism of communism fundamentally rejects the idea of human rights and individual dignity. To the Politburo in Berlin or Moscow, the people of East Germany, like all the communist states, were not citizens, they were serfs. They were assets to be used to generate income Everything and everyone can be sacrificed in the state's name in that system. East Germany's forced labor was built on this immoral foundation, and as research has shown, the state relied on forced labor from political prisoners in virtually every industry, from metalworking, furniture, mining, clothing, construction, farming industries, among others. The GDR treated people as property to be used until they broke. And this tribunal will uncover more details about the breadth and depth of this evil system. By the time we leave, we'll be able to paint a fuller picture of forced labor in East Germany, and then we'll be in a better place to pursue justice for those who suffered so much for so long. The importance of this work cannot be overstated because what we are doing here can be a model 
for the victims of communism in other countries. 30 years after Germany's reunification and 31 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the free world still needs a moral and legal reckoning with the crimes of communism. From Germany to Georgia, from Armenia to Albania, and in nearly 40 other nations, the victims of communism have still not received the attention and the action that they deserve. In the United States, we have a saying that justice delayed is justice denied. For those who labored and suffered under the brutal rule of communism, justice has been delayed for far too long. And accountability can wait no longer. The victims of communism in East Germany deserve their due. And the stories we'll hear in the coming days are from decades gone by, yet forced labor in communist regimes did not end in 1990. It continues to this day. In fact, the dictators of the 21st century have learned from the forced labor systems of the 20th century and even improved upon them. Today, we are seeing innovations in forced labor across the globe. Consider an example from the Western Hemisphere. 90 miles off the coast of the United States lies communist Cuba. The regime in Havana uses forced labor, not only to make money, but to spread communist propaganda around the world. Cuba's forced labor program involves medical professionals. Every year, the country selects doctors and nurses and sends them abroad. Currently, as many as 50,000 Cuban medical professionals can be found in at least 60 countries, from the Americas to Asia to Africa and beyond. Cuba claims to be engaging in humanitarian work, but of course, this is a lie. It is nothing more than a novel form of forced labor. The Cuban doctors do not work for themselves. The government in Havana steals their wages, which amounts to some $11 billion every year, more than 10% of Cuba's GDP. It also compels the doctors to support local socialist and communist uh, politicians and prop them up in the regimes that Cuba supports, like the dictatorship in Venezuela. Meanwhile, back home, the doctors' families are held as hostages. Far from doing their jobs willingly, these doctors work to ensure the safety of their loved ones from the brutality of Cuba's Communist Party. There is no question that this is forced labor. We need only ask the doctors themselves. Many have come forward in recent days with stories about Havana's uh, abuse and theft of their labor. One doctor who defected recently in Brazil while working there declared, and I quote, there comes a time when you just get tired of being a slave. Like the victims of the GDR, the, victim, the victims of Cuba's forced labor program deserve justice too. Another example of modern day forced labor comes from North Korea. In 2018, there were some 2.6 million North Koreans living in slavery, or more than one out of every 10 Koreans in the country. By some estimates, a significant majority, much more than 50% of North Koreans have endured forced labor at some point in their lives. Huge numbers of the victims are children as young as 10 years old or even younger. Like the Soviet gulag, North Korea's forced labor system has a name, the Kwan Lee So. It is fair to say that North Korea's economy is built on a foundation of forced labor. Political prisoners build the country's bridges and apartment buildings. They slave away in the mines and on farms. Tens of thousands of North Koreans have also been sent to China, where they work in factories, or to Russia, where they work in logging facilities. Countless prisoners die from malnutrition and abysmal working conditions, which include working in the coldest months of winter without shoes. Several years ago, a survivor of Auschwitz and renowned human rights lawyer Thomas Bergenthal said that North Korea's forced labor camps are as terrible or worse than the Nazi concentration camps in which he lived. 
from what I have heard of North Korean defectors, I believe that North Korea's labor camps are the most brutal places on the planet today. Like the victims of the GDR, the victims of forced labor in North Korea deserve justice too. And finally, there's communist China. It has been a fact of life there since the 1950s, forced labor. It has been institutionalized in China as part of the Laogai system, which translates as reform through labor. Between 40 and 50 million people have been sent to China's labor camps since the regime's founding. And currently, more than 1,000 forced labor camps are active in the People's Republic of China. The number of prisoners is unknown, but the estimates put it well into the millions. The world has more recently come to a greater recognition of China's forced labor in the last few years, where before the communist authorities in China primarily targeted political dissidents and certain religious faiths, now they are targeting an entire ethnic group, the predominantly Muslim Uyghurs of Xinjiang. As many as three million Uyghurs have been sent to camps where they undergo indoctrination and torture. As part of their imprisonment, many Uyghurs are forced to work at Chinese factories. These factories are part of the global supply chains today for at least 83 well-known companies, including Apple, BMW, Lacoste, Nike, Microsoft, Volkswagen, and Zara. This year, during the COVID pandemic, Uyghurs were forced to make face masks that were shipped across the world. In addition to forced labor, many Uyghurs have their organs harvested for sale to wealthy foreigners. Practitioners of Falun Gong, a religious movement that Beijing fears, are subjected to the same horrific treatment. Much like Cuba, this represents an innovation in forced labor, China has found a way to profit from their victims in both life and death. And once again, like the victims of the GDR, the millions of forced laborers in communist China deserve justice too. And so it is against this global backdrop that we gather here over the next few days for this tribunal. The discussions that we have and the testimonies that we hear will rightly focus on the past, but we cannot lose sight of the global reality that surrounds us. The crimes we'll hear about are not so different from what is happening today in Cuba, North Korea, and China. The particulars may be different, but the larger point is the same. Communism is the world's worst perpetrator of forced labor. It was true in the 20th century, and it's true in the 21st century. No matter when it occurred or where it occurred or what form it takes, it is our duty to condemn it and call for its abolition. By taking a stand against the evil actions of the GDR and the Soviet Union, we say to the communist regimes of today, we recognize and reject their oppression. As a millennial American, I can think of no better exercise to ensure that we will have better lives this century than to consciously learn the lessons of the last century. And so on this front, I express my sincere appreciation to all of you. You, Germans who are gathered here for your vital work in challenging our civilization to not commit the crime of forgetfulness. In so many ways, Germany proved to be the crucible on which new ideologies of the last century were forged. And the tragic failures of fascism and communism especially, and also Germany's profound overcoming of war and terror, makes your country uniquely able to warn the perhaps naive populations elsewhere about all we must safeguard and all we could lose by falling for the unnatural, inhumane, and extremist ideologies that deny the dignity of each and every human life. 
All this goes to say our work here matters more than we know. So let us pursue justice for the past and the present. And together, let's build a future free of communism and create a world more worth living for my young daughter and your children and their children. Thank you. Mr. Smith, thank you very much for this emotional speech. Thank you, Mr. Smith, for this very emotional speech and for this look out into the world and into all these countries in which communism is still present. So we now come to two words salute. We will now hear um, the Commission of the Land of Brandenburg uh, to reappraise the consequences of communist dictatorship, Maria Noke. Oh, they all have their different titles, so I needed to make sure I get the right. So Dr. Maria Noke, welcome. Thanks for coming. In Brandenburg sind wir sogar zuständig Hello there, in Brandenburg we're even responsible to deal with the consequences of communist dictatorship, which is very important to mention. First of all, I would like to thank the speaker who just took the floor. Thanks for directing our attention to the, to the present, and to the international perspective communism still has. Thanks very much for that. I will now come back to Germany and to the federal state of Brandenburg. So from the international arena, we are narrowing the view down to the situation in this federal state of Brandenburg. The Union of Victims Associations, in a cooperation of, with the name partners, is addressing an important issue which continues to affect many people affected by political imprisonment to this very day and the heavy burdens of forced labor during the period of political imprisonment is uh, something very recurring in our counseling and consulting work. This is particularly evident in cases where those affected have often unsuccessfully made claims for recognition of the damage to their health caused by imprisonment. On the basis of the talks we've had and the consultation experience, we have included this topic in the study on the social situation of formerly politically persecuted people, which my own agency was commissioned to carry out by the Brandenburg State Parliament. The study is about to be published soon. I can already give you the first results on the consequences of experiencing injustice and in prison and work in imprisonment. As part of the investigation, Brandenburg citizens who were politically persecuted in the Soviet zone and the DDR or who suffered systemic injustice were asked to provide us with information on their current living situation. And for the first time, we also interviewed and surveyed relatives of uh, people who had suffered from political persecution. So the results say that 70% of all respondents said that they were suffering from um, mental health problems and 38% reported physical complaints. 69% of those surveyed had been in prison or had suffered from some custody measures in the DER in its youth welfare institutions. I don't have to say here that also the young people, teenagers in the youth institutions and orphanages were forced to work. 23% of our respondents stated that Currently, they were suffering physical harm as a consequence from their prison or homework. Of these group, 78% feel strongly or rather heavily affected. The information on the state of health in which the physical damage caused by prison or homework was included included both the survey of medically diagnosed illnesses and also the self-assessment of their state of health. Several illnesses were also able to be named in the survey for every case. So we compared the results with the state of health of the average population of the over 50 years of age people in Brandenburg from the microcensus data of the Brandenburg population. So the medically diagnosed chronic back pain problems were reported by 47% of all respondents. Comparing it to that, 28% of the Brandenburg population of over 50 years of age are affected. 
People who had to do work in prison thus suffer from such complaints almost 20% more frequently today. Medically diagnosed joint diseases like osteoarthritis and rheumatism are cited and quoted by 47% of those surveyed. In comparison, 42% of the Brandenburg population are affected, so the share of the former workers in prison is so much higher. And asthma is mentioned by 12% of, respond, of respondents, as opposed to only 5% of the general population in the 50 plus years of age population. So you can see that the medically diagnosed complaints and pains are considerably higher than in the total po population of the comparable age group. The number of complaints about physical impairments related to the experience of injustice is even higher when patients report themselves. 43% of them named pain and pain disorders of undefined nature. 37% spoke of skeleton and joint damages, and 26% of them reported an impairment of their internal organs or their organ systems. And also skin diseases and skin alterations played a role. 15% of respondents named them because there were also works that had to be carried out, and we will learn more about this tomorrow, causing skin diseases. So. 15% of people surveyed were affected. The effects forced labor during imprisonment had up to the present and has had up to the present is therefore of immense importance. At this conference, we will gain insight into the conditions that have led to such heavy stress and burden that last to the very day. To name these and to make them public is an important task in reckoning and coming to terms with the systemic injustice in the Soviet socialist and GDR zones. And I think this conference will contribute to this. And I'm very much looking forward to the discussion and to hearing the talks. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Ms. Noke. Thank you very much for giving us these first insights in this very important study. So finally, we will hear Ms. Birgit Neumann-Becker, who is the State Commissioner of the Federal State of Saxony Anhalt for the study um, of SED dictatorship. Welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Dombrovsky, I would like to thank you very much for the invitation to this tribunal. As a state commissioner of Saxony-Anhalt of coming to terms with SED dictatorship, um, the compulsion to work be belongs to the system of socialism. You've described this. After gigantic forced labor camps, gulags, they were called, after those were set up in the Soviet Union for enemies of the state, opponents of the system were subjected to severe repression, repression in the socialist countries of the Eastern Bloc as well to this very day. At a conference of the German Left Party in March this year, an angry participant called for the shooting of um, wealthy people. Party leader Rixner tried to put a smile on his face by saying, well, we won't shoot them. We can still use them to do useful work. And it's not the, the socialist fantasy of omnipotence, which is so shattering here, but uh, the spontaneous uh, re recurring to communist dictatorship. Um, in our daily consultations with former prisoners and inmates of GDR youth work yards, I and my staff are constantly confronted with the long-term impact of forced labor. And this affects all types of facilities. And in almost every counseling situation, there are particularly harrowing memories that come to victims' minds. Almost all of them speak about the burden and stress they felt. And just as often, they report humiliation and degradation, and they speak of the loss of dignity in connection with the working conditions they had to experience. Between 1945 and 1989, there were about 55 detention centers in the territory of today's Saxony-Anhalt alone, and 180 uh, specialist facilities, which uh, sent thousands of cheap laborers, which were 
allowed to be exposed to special dangers. Several reports will tell you about this, also for the federal state of Saxony-Anhalt, which is I will, why I will be brief in my description, but there's one thought that matters to me. Forced workers were relevant to uphold the system, which is particularly bitter because um, prisoners were used on machines um, that often did not meet the requirements of occupational safety. The health was deliberately and permanently damaged while they were in prison under GDR state custody. Basically, they had lost their right to physical integrity when they were sentenced. And I would like to make it clear at this point, we're talking about political imprisonment here. It is not at all clear to me how and why criminal offenders in prison did not have the right to determine their physical integrity. This topic on a whole is a subject matter which we need to speak about relating to the GDS prison system and also with regard to the so-called youth work camps. It's a very, very important part of the reappraisal of the situation to speak about these experiences and to uh, talk about um, the infringement of international law, which happened in, in GDR times. I would like to wish your work here every success, the necessary clarity, the necessary attention of the public and the awareness, not just of the general public, but also of politicians. This is what these important questions deserve to be to be treated like. And let me say that I am very happy to be able to contribute with the exhibition you can see up here on the walls of this room. This exhibition was put together in 2016 together with Christian Sachse and UOKG, the Union of Vist Victims Associations. We took the example of the federal state of Saxony-Anhalt to explain how what forced labor looked like and in which companies forced laborers were used, how women were deployed, how teenagers were deployed, and what the consequences of this deployment was. Also, the way this was communicated. So with this exhibition, we traveled many cities of the federal state of Saxony-Anhalt, but we also went to the south of Germany, and we hosted a series of very interesting and fruitful events with former prisoners. I would like to wish this conference and this tribunal every success. I would like to thank you for your kind attention and for this invitation, ladies and gentlemen. So, vielen Dank. Thank you very much, Ms. Neumann-Becker. So with that, we conclude our introductory remarks, and now we're going to start our keynote speak speeches. And there are three dedicated experts who've been dealing with the topic of forced labor for a long time. Dr. Christian Sachse is the first speaker. We, he's very dear to our heart. He works for the UA, UOKG, and he uh, is, was also one of the organizers of this exhibition, and he's going to be the first speaker and give the keynote speech. I wasn't in the mood to make jokes. You said that he, I'm very dear to your heart, but this is what people also said of the uh, leaders of the National Socialist um, system. But well, I would like to welcome the contemporary witnesses who for many years uh, are undertaken, undertaking the efforts to share the things they witnessed. And they also share the feeling, when is it going to um, show some effect? what we reveal. And I would also like to welcome the members of the jury who hopefully will give us a verdict in the end we can all live with. And ladies and gentlemen, the history of slavery and forced labor is not a success story. It started 240 years ago and 
hasn't come to an end ever since. There was one first milestone amongst several milestones, and that was the Anti-Slavery Convention of the League of Nations uh, of 1926. And it was signed by 124 states until today. The Convention of the ILO number 29 on forced labor and compulsory labor that entered into force on 1st of May 1932. With that convention, the signatory states undertook to do away with any kind of forced labor or compulsory labor in all its shapes as soon as possible. That was in 1932. After a five years transitory period, this means in 1937, forced and compulsory labor should be abolished without any further delay. You all know what happened later on in history. During that transition period, forced and compulsory labor was only allowed to be used for public purposes and only in exceptional cases. There was an exception, and I would like to state that explicitly, and this will play a role in this tribunal. An exception was any kind of work or service that, would rend that had to be rendered by a person based on a court verdict, and this will play a role during our tribunal. The convention also imposed very strict restrictions on the authority when it came to the treatment of forced laborers with regard to the duration payment, medical treatments, food and clothing and other conditions. These rules also applied to prisoners and the public authorities were obliged to monitor th that these regulations were adhered to. That was uh, at the beginning of the 1930s of la the last century. This promising development was put an end to very soon, after a few years. In October 1933, Germany exited the League of Nations and evaded its obligation to abolish forced labor. And there's a parallel, parallel development, which is a little awkward, and that is that the Soviet Union, in spite of temporarily being a member in the League of Nations, entertained a ever-growing system of forced labor, which in 1935 exceeded the limit or the threshold of a million, and in 1950 ex exceeded the threshold of 2.5 million prisoners. Against the backdrop of the excessive expansion of forced labor during the National Socialist era, the Nuremberg Military Court of Justice did no longer speak about forced or compulsory labor as was usual in international texts, but uh, they spoke about slave labor. If ever you looked into the verdicts of the Nuremberg Military Court of Justice, I'm sure you are aware of the slave labor verdicts. And the slave labor verdicts of the Court of Justice motivated the international organization to proceed to manifold activities to finally overcome slave lab um, forced labor in other areas of the world. In several international conventions, a general ban on forced labor was imposed after 1945. So, and that's important, there was a general ban on forced labor, but there were some exceptions that were admissible. Forced labor is, ever since then, has been deemed to be a restriction of a human fundamental right, of a human right, and it is admissible under certain conditions, but they have to be conditioned by the rule of law. The European Human Rights Convention of, 4th of November 4th, 1950, in Article 4, stipulates that forced labor can be implemented in that way. With this concession to global practice, the implementation of forced labor is no longer subjected to the arbitrary decisions of states and authorities, but it has to be interpreted in the context and in the spirit of international conventions on human rights. Let me summarize. 
this restriction of human rights, this means that human rights can be restricted and that forced labor can be admissible also in accordance with international law, but there are very strict restrictions. And these restrictions is something that we should look on during this tribunal. In the international negotiations at the beginning of the 1950s, the system of forced labor in the Soviet area of control was looked at. And in um, by making reference to the slave labor verdicts of the Nuremberg Court of Justice, in 1947, upon initiative of a U.S., American of the U.S. American Federation of Labor, there was a complaint uh, with the United Nations of the Soviet Union because of their system. So the Soviet Union was accused because of the system of forced labor. So there was a distinction made between forced labor and slave labor because it one made reference to the National Socialism, but the two types of labor were supposed to be investigated. In debates of the Human Rights Committee of the United Nations, a distinction was made for the first time between political offenders and common criminals. So that said, if someone is a, a criminal, it is a acceptable for the person to be imposed to forced labor, but a political offender, that is different. There is the presumption that the political uh, offender will be loyal to his or her um, attitude and cannot be subjected to forced labor. And this is an idea that goes back to the 1940s. The Economic and Social Committee of the United Nations decided to carry out a global investigation, a global study on different uh, types of forced labor, and this is highly interesting, and I'd li like to ask my colleagues to listen up, because it was on um, prison, corrective, and educational work, and this was intentional that it was called that way, so as it, so that it didn't have to be called forced labor. In At the UN, there is a huge, huge discussion on that, and we should take it into account. This study was carried out, but the states and the area of, con of power of the Soviet Union refused to give any information. The expert body of international NGOs, amongst them the Association of Liberal Lawyers, the International League for Human Rights, and former political prisoners from the East were uh, heard. The accusations against the Soviet Union and the German Democratic Republic for the very first time were given a document, documentation based foundation. That was at the beginning of the 1950s. So if somebody was to say that this was a new finding, uh, these people didn't take note of the documents that were already drawn up in the 1950s. In June 1953, this investigation report was published, uh, 630 pages, and the rapporteur came to the conclusion that in the Soviet Union and in the people's democracies, a system of forced labor was applied that served the purpose, uh, and I paraphrase, of political re-education and correction of those persons who are not in line with communist uh, the communist ideology of the government. For the GDR, the following um, characterizing signs were mentioned. Um, prison and correction, work, forced labor in general, and later on that didn't play such a, a role anymore, but it was about work in the uranium mines. The existence of uh, forced labor camps and what was criticized uh, were the conditions, the health and work conditions in the camps and the uranium mines. Forced labor in the Soviet area of power exceeded n usual civilian obligations, and with that it was declared illegal. Let me explain. In prisons, it does make sense to have an independent administration, but this means additional, this implies work, and this work is uh, meaningful, but if it goes beyond that, if it exceeds that there are many diff this is a different story. These findings that also revealed uh, comprehensive violations in the rest of the world led to the first Congress of the United Nations on crime prevention and on the treatment of offenders in Geneva in 1955. The committee decided upon minimum uh, standards for the treatment of prisoners 
which became an official text of the United Nations uh, thanks to the approval by the Economic and Social Council on the 31st of July 1957. We've ever since then we've had a document by the UN, 80 pages or articles strong, that declare the minimum standards according to which uh, prisoners have to be treated, and they. Um, prohibit discrimination uh, because of political convictions and relig religion. Prisoners were ha were to be separated um, with regard to the reasons why they had been arrested. So political and other criminal prisoners had to be separated. The cells had to be uh, lighted enough and had to have ventilation and sanitary uh, installations. You might remember the house close by. Well, there were similar uh, stipulations or provisions for clothing, uh, beds, uh, personal sanitary items, accommodation, etc. Disciplinary sanctions were already uh, determined at the time of uh, physical punishments, being kept in the dark, as well as humiliating inhuman um, punishments are are prohibited without any exception. And it was said on the uh, on about the work in prison. The working in prison shouldn't be designed in a way that the prisoner suffers. Within the limits of selecting a suitable profession and in the framework of the needs of the administration of a prison, the prisoners have to have the possibility to choose the work they want to do. The provisions made to protect the safety and health of the workers uh, in freedom have to apply to the inmates of prisons. Measures have to be taken to compensate prisoners in the case of an accident at work or occupational disease. And the conditions should not be below those that civilian workers have. That was a rule in the 1950s already. And you're all experts here today. And you can compare it to the practice as it was the order of the day. Based on the findings of the reports that are described, the International Labour Organization uh, adopted the Convention num Number 105 on the abolition of forced labour in June 1957. The signatory states, and of course the GDR wasn't part of them, the signatory states committed to do away with forced and compulsory labor and to not use it at all. It was not to be used as a mean of political coercion or edu political education or as a punishment vis-a-vis -vis persons who have certain political um, opinions and ex or express them. Um, or uh, have an ideology that goes against the political, social, or economic order, so political prisoners. According to the ILO Convention number 105, this is prohibited. Secondly, uh, forced labor is prohibited as a method of recruiting and using um, of workers for the purpose of economic development. You could compare it if you wanted to, uh, if you want to. And it was prohibited as a measure of working discipline. It's very interesting because the the working camps were characteristic for the GDR. Um, and uh, it was prohibited as a punishment for participating in strikes and as a measure of racist, social, national, or re religious discrimination. The International Pact on Civilian and Political Rights of 1966 clearly stated once more that, uh, that obliging prisoners to work, and that's important, could only happen, was only allowed if this obligation was instructed by a court explicitly and individually to carry out forced labor. And there are discussions on how to interpret these, these texts. And there are those who say that it, uh, forced labor only applies to those that were uh, sentenced. But what is meant is an explicit sentence to carry out forced labor. 
And then this was the case when exemptions were, exceptions were made. But as things were implemented in the GDR, according to the International Pact on Social and Civil Rights of 1966, the way it was implemented, forced labor was implemented in the GDR is illegal. What is admissible is uh, normal services to maintain operations in the prison, and I think that this makes sense. The uh, International Labour Office, I'm going to shorten my presentation a bit. So the ILO uh, ex made a, uh, added an additional comment to the conventions 29 and 105, and the, it is said that the work has to be imposed by a court, forced labour, which is imposed by other authorities outside of the court system is not compatible with the ILO convention. So there's a clear definition and a restriction of forced labor. But that was not abided by at all in the GDR. Let me mention two or three more aspects that I find important. Amnesty International, we uh, have to be very grateful to Amnesty International. In 1967, in a German publication, they draw the attention to the working conditions in uh, GDR prisons, and they carried out their own um, research and interviews with former prisoners and presented their cases. It's become very clear that the International Society for Human Rights, uh, Mr. Hafner has mentioned already, we owe the society, International Society a lot because in 1986 they carried out an interview of former political prisoners that they published later on. And nobody ever since then could say that they didn't know. I mean, this is a brochure that was available everywhere. And I've just heard that there was a very large-scale distribution of this document. So you cannot, nobody can say, the Western companies cannot claim that they didn't know. This is unacceptable. At this point, I would like to emphasize once more that these activities were very important for us, although I mentioned the 240 years of history of combating forced labor and that there was little success, but still, the work has been very important. Let me summarize. The GDR did not act uh, in accordance with the ILO Convention 29 and acted towards an end of all types of forced and compulsory labor. As several studies confirm, they perfected, per permanently perfected the system of forced labor. The ILO Convention didn't say that uh, forced labor had to be abolished, but that the states have to undertake efforts, and GD the GDR didn't sign it. The GDR violated all bans on forced labor of the ILO Convention 105. The GDR used forced labor for the economic development and uh, for labor education, and they used political prisoners for forced labor. And the GDR violated the Civil Rights Pact and the authorized interpretation of the ILO Convention 29 because they um, used forced labor and based it on the flimsy term of labor education. And they violated, the, the GDR violated the ILO Convention because they systematically violated the minimum principles on the treatment of prisoners of 1955. My colleague and I, we've just tried to find out once more when the GDR um, signed the minimum principles. It was probably in the mid-70s, and after that they had been they had committed uh, and had been committed by the interna by international law to keep these standards. These findings were known already at a very early point in time. The Economic and Social Council of the United Nations reported about that uh, as early as 1953. So this argument that they 
didn't know, which is mentioned time and time again, this is an argument that cannot be accepted anymore. At the same time, in, we should be aware that the international law provides us with excellent tools and a set of values that we can make use of to, to uh, assess and judge the system of forced labor in the GDR. And I wish you a lot of success for your tribunal. Dear Mr. Sachse, dear Christian, thank you very much for this lecture. Thank you very much. Well, uh, we're not on schedule now, as always, with our events, but it's not a problem because it's so interesting. Now we will welcome our next speaker, Dr. Jan Philipp Wilburn, um, who will deliver his lecture from his seat because he has broken a lip. This is on forced labor of political prisoners in SED dictatorship. Ladies and gentlemen, let me thank you for this kind invitation. Thanks very much to the speaker preceding me, Mr. Sachse, who has already given us a detailed introduction in, uh, into, into the topic. First of all, let me introduce myself. Why am I here? It, I'm here for two reasons. First of all, I'm a historian. And um, in my work, I have studied forced labor in the GDR, and the redemption of political prisoners was a subject matter of uh, my PhD thesis, and some of you here in the audience might have been redeemed as well in that time. And I'm a member of um, the board of the Human Rights Center. So this is another reason for me being here. My task today is uh, to speak about forced labor with political prisoners and SED dictatorship. I will try and limit myself to 20 minutes now. Let me speak about two aspects. First of all, let me make it clear that this is a case example here. If we want to take a look at panels on the wall, we can see forced labor is being deployed in all the world, and I will now speak about forced labor applied in the GDR. The second aspect I would like to look into is to shed some light on the political prisoners as opposed to criminal offenders who also were inmates at the prisons, not so much here in Cottbus as in other prisons, but that was also the case. In 2015, I published a study on the subject matter for the Federal State Commissioner, for the um, um, former GDR states, uh, former GDR, and um, was in this was on detention and the Ministry of the Interior of the GDR. I studied many documents, also documents of prisoners, and these are the sources I will refer to tonight. What's my talk about? First of all, I shall say some words on the legal and ideological foundations of work in prison. Then I will speak about the economic importance of that work. Mr. Sachs has already alluded to that. And thirdly, I will ask about the type of forced labor political prisoners had to do. Which industry were they used in? Which work did they have to fulfill? And in the fourth part of my talk, I shall speak about the question of whether forced laborers in prison were worse off than civilian workers in the DDR who had to work in, on several um, comparable works. For example, there were some companies who produced outside and inside a detention center. So what was it like in comparison? And what was the role of, of political prisoners in the hierarchy of a detention center? 
Development Center, and then I shall come to my conclusions. Now, on the legal and ideological foundations of forced labor, as you know, the GDR had an established right to work which was enshrined in the Constitution. This meant, the other way around, that there was an obligation to work. So this held true for civilian workers and prisoner workers alike. So forced labor, according to the ideological understanding of the GDR, was the, the regular case. It wasn't an exception, but um, this was the normality in the whole GDR. As Mr. Sachse quite rightly said, in theory, the work to educate people, the work was there to educate people to become full citizens of the GDR in a socialist society. But in practice, all studies show that the primary goal of work in prison was to make an economic contribution to fulfill the plan. And you can already tell that from the fact that um, forced laborers in prison were a firm part of any states and of the GDR states planning. Already in 1960, a document says that the purpose of detention is to use prisoners to fulfill the economic tasks of society and to exploit them to that purpose. As you can see, the, it was economic consideration ideology and theory did not play so much of a role there. The second aspect, the economic importance of work done in prison. Well, there is no table indicating how many crimin uh, criminal offenders versus political prisoners were used in GDR to be forced laborers in prisons, but we can estimate their number. We can assume that 15 to 30,000 people form part of that group, and in some peak years, they, they were even more. So that group was forced to work in prison. If you compare that to the overall population, this was half a percent, 0.5 percent of the overall working population of the DDR. So the specificity of that work wasn't this marginal contribution, but the fact that prisoners were able to be used for works which civilian workers did not want to fulfill. For example, for the reason of the labor being unattractive or very hard or very poorly paid. And on top of that, prisoners were used in the very sensitive areas of society and economy. So so whenever an amnesty was coming up, any administration of detention centers were starting to get nervous because they thought that they would be losing important numbers of prisoners and that might have uh, led to shortage in energy supply because thousands of prisoners had to work in lignite mining in open cast mining, so with any amnesty plans, there was a threatening lack of workers ahead. The question has much been discussed whether forced labor for the state's budget overall was rather a deficit or rather a profit bringing business. It's hard to say that, it's hard to bring some solid figures in here. But we must see that on the one hand, it was attractive to use prisoners as laborers because you were able to use them for um, industries in which no civilian workers were found. And you could simply save investments in safety and health at the workplace. You didn't have to buy new machinery. And there was no claim whatsoever to ever go on holiday with prisoners. I once asked a former prisoner whether in prison he ever had days off work. And he just simply said, Weimar, is that supposed to be a joke? Are you joking? So as you can see, there were some incentives for civilian companies to employ and deploy prison workers. Still, in the study I published some years ago, I tried to make some calculations using the company Esther Thalheim, and I think we will hear about it tomorrow, on whether um, exporting the products made by prisoners made that made companies profit. But still, there was a 
a gap that remains. So I very much doubt whether considerable profit was made. But uh, this was all about foreign currency that was brought into the country. And the longer the GDR lasted, uh, the more important this motive beca became because foreign currency was so urgently needed. On my third aspect, which is where what was the position of political prisoners, comparing them with uh, criminal offenders or regular prisoners, where were they def deployed? Well, until the start of the 1960s, political prisoners were distributed in all uh, penitentiaries of the GDR. I was able to look at the archives of the Ministry of the Interior with hundreds of thousands of bits of information on criminal offenders in prison. And I was able to tell that almost in every prison in the GDR there were political prisoners too. This changed in the course of the 1960s after the wall was built because the state security, the Stasi, was concerned that many of the failed attempts to flee the Republic and that led to imprisonment, that these prisoners would have a negative influence on other prisoners. So the fear was, and I'll put this um, maybe a bit more easy to understand, uh, it was feared that the criminal offenders might be infected uh, through the political prisoners. So the idea was to put the political prisoners in two or three separate jails uh, to turn them into mere political detention centers. It, this wasn't done, but um, a sort of a solution was found and certain prisons were used to host more political prisoners than others. For example, here in Cottbus, which was a focus detention center for political prisoners, and also in Brandenburg and Hohenegg and later on in Rummelsburg and in Nauenburg and in Karl Marx Stadt in Hohendoldern and in Halle in the 1980s, a very high number of political prisoners were detained. Some of them, some of the prisons had so many political prisoners that those formed the majority of prisoners. But on the other way, on the other hand, there were also some prisons that ha saw hardly any political prisoners. There's one example, and I don't know whether we're going to speak about it tomorrow, but there is one prison which um, had um, prisoner workers in Bitterfeld in the chemical industry. Until 1963, um, there, were, there were political prisoners there. After that, there was an order stating that no political prisoners would be detained there anymore because the fear was that through the redeemed prisoners who went to West Germany, uh, this topic would be um, too much a focus of the media. Why am I telling you all this? This had a consequence on the places in which political prisoners were affected by forced labor. And these industries, I can't name them all, but there's some industry we can exclude or we can describe a trend. Lignite mining, a typical industrial activity for, for uh, criminal offenders, where was a bit atypical for the um, political prisoners. And also the chemical industry in the 1980s did not see that many political prisoners working there. And yes, in former times, but not from the start of the 1980s on. I now come to my next part, which is the question of the way political prisoners were um, set in the hierarchy, comparing them with other types of prisoners. Christian Sachs already mentioned this. Having prisoners work wasn't just legitimate, but it was even it is even an obligation for all United Nations member states to let prisoners work. So it might be curious, but some people even said, some prisoners said that they wanted to work. But of course, this statement, which we often hear and read in former prisoners' reports, should not be misunderstood. It is merely a statement of saying that um, 
working is a very welcome distraction from not doing anything. It's the smaller evil, but it tells us nothing about the hands-on conditions of prison and detention. So the type and severity or hardship suffer through work varied very much because it depended very much on the company in which prisoners had to work. It uh, could, might have been the hardest physical work like uh, track construction, lig lignite mining over to um, areas that might have been monotonous with less of a physical strain but loads of mental burdens and strains. And that's why many prisoners describe this type of work as a heavy burden because they weren't even qualified for these activities or they had only been taught for a very short time and, and because it was very difficult for them to fulfill the plan or the standard and because there was pressure all the time, because they weren't able to take a leave or to ever recover, because there was no medical assistance. We heard about this in um, the talks preceding me. And um, in, the, in the chemical production near Bitterfeld, it's been well proven that prisoners were used to do the dirty work. Justus Westing, one of my colleagues, published on this subject matter, so there's quite a lot of proof and many sources showing this. There's a quote from a report of the Ministry for State Security saying that uh, ministers are reporting a difficulty in finding laborers to do extremely strenuous physical work done by prisoners before, and this was in, in regard with amnesty activities. Uh, we also find a good uh, proof for the, the setting of hierarch hierarchies in prisons and amongst prisoners. Key positions were typically held by criminal offenders who were on long-term, were serving long-term sentences. And then, of course, uh, the next level in the hierarchy down were other criminal, criminal offenders and then the political prisoners were furthest down. Fulfilling working standards and working norms or plans is also very important to mention. There was a general order to say that, um, so that criminal offenders and political offenders and political prisoners were to be dealt with the same way. But every company was able to adapt this for their own purposes and do whatever they wished. There's a quote from a report of the administration of prisons saying that following insufficient control of the fulfillment of plan through the ministries, the labor productivity of prisoners is so planned or adapted to match the company's requirements. And this might have been up to 130 percent or more of uh, the expected standard, standard, or in some cases, maybe less. So it depended on the situation of the given company, whether the norms were respected. This is why reports about um, alterated or exaggerated norms are credible, because it depended on the detention centers and on the companies how this was handled. And also there was an incentive to overfulfill the norm. Incentive sounds a bit technical, but it meant in concrete terms that many prisoners were forced to fulfill these norms because they needed to do it to buy food to actually survive prison. On working times, also a topic often mentioned, and here again, we, we come to the same finding. In legal terms, it was actually inadmissible to let prisoners work many extra hours. But in practice, overtime had to be done through extra shifts, which had to do uh, voluntarily in inverted commas. And shift work was also a regular phenomenon. There's um, some very clear figures on that. I wanted to explain these to you. Around 50% of all prisoners in 1977, political and criminal offenders, were forced to work in a three-shift system. So 
they had to work in the morning, in the afternoon, and at night. So when this same frequency was uh, asked or required of civilian workers, which was the case for 20% of all industrial workers, then you see that the frequency for the political prisoners was so much higher than for the civilian workers. There was a systemic element in the way shift work was used. So next topic, all studies who've dealt with this next topic, health and safety in the worst place, all studies say that these measures was, were absolutely insufficient. And Sylvia Wheeling already talked about where this uh, led to. And there's hardly any report by political prisoners that would not have uh, spoken of smaller or bigger infringements of health and safety regulations in the workplace. There's also a figure on this that is often quoted when we take a look at um, at uh, the um, accident rate, 30 percent to twice the accident rate or even more, comparing these accidents to um, civilian workers was the norm. So there was such a high prob probability of prisoners suffering an accident. And this was just the, um, the accidents that had to be reported the LTIF rate. Um, so since the end of the 1950s, around 10% of a comparable net income was available because to the company because the payments they had to made did not have to be made to the prisoners. There wasn't even a work contract with them because it was a right of the detention center to be paid the money. So a company would only indirectly pay as much as 10% of a regular wage to the political prisoners. And let me speak about punishment and sanction upon refusal to work. When the performance was lower than the norm or when prisoners refused to work, then there were very harsh sanctions. So. Um, Things like having better visiting times or receiving parcels was something was a benefit that could be completely withdrawn. Also, cutting wages was a very, very frequent example, and also a rest in the dark, like here in Cottbus. Here in the permanent exhibition on the second floor, we have some, some examples of that. So you're welcome to to take a look at at that as you um, go and see the tour and the exhibition. But only very few prisoners refuse, permanent, refuse to work um, on a permanent basis. There's an example of 1978 saying that only 1.3% of prisoners permanently refused to work. It was only a small percentage also because the sanctions and the punishment was so harsh. To conclude, I would like to make some remarks on the long-term consequences of work in imprisonment. Christian Sachse alluded to that. It is so hard to explicitly um, trace back physical pain to the consequences of prison, because prison as such, in a combination with work, has to be considered as uh, something that goes hand in hand. And you cannot see those separately, apart from um, this example of somebody cutting, having a finger cut off in during punching works. But this is a methodological problem that we cannot solve. But um, Ms. Noke has referred us to the fact that the consequential damage can clearly be keep be told. I shall conclude and um, summarize with three theses. First assumption, work was had an educative function in the GDR, but in prison it had an economic function. Prisoners were used for that type of work, which for civilian workers was deemed unattractive because it was too hard. Second assumption, some industries since the 1980s became atypical to use political prisoners like lignite mining and the chemical industry after 1983. All in all, we can say that criminal offenders and political prisoners had a had a worse situation as comparing them with civilian workers, but this depends on the industry and work had to be done under 
the conditions of um, the workers being imprisoned, which is also something we have to consider. And last assumption, working conditions were fundamentally worse than in regular work situations, more hazard to uh, workers' health or harsh sanctions in the case of refusal to work. The question of the responsibility of um, West German companies wasn't part of my study back then when I did it, but let me make the following comment. This is a very general question we are dealing with here, the question of responsibility in a globalized economy which is a general trend we've been seeing in the last um, decades. So basically, as a world community, we need to face the question of that responsibility. But maybe we can make a little contribution today uh, to uh, raising our awareness for this general question. Thanks a lot for your time and your attention. I now hand over to Ms. Kill. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wölber, for your presentation. Because before we start, give Ms. Kill the floor. There's uh, one car, uh, the license plate of which uh, the speaker just mentioned. So please remove your car, otherwise it's going to be towed. Dr. Susanne Kill, she's the last speaker for today. She's a historian at Deutsche Bahn. The title is Forced Labor Done by Prisoners for the German Reichsbahn of the GDR, Historical Research and Politics of Remembrance. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to thank you very warmly for inviting me to present the results of a study, a study which was published in 2016. So it was the same year when the exhibition opened. I think I saw it in Halle the first time, and I also heard a lecture by Christian Sachse. I'm sure that many of you already know the results of the study. This is where I would like to draw your attention to the historical research and the possibilities with regard to politics of remembrance we have seen from a very specific perspective, which is the case of my employer, the Deutsche Bahn AG. So now we're going to narrow it down to the historical research. So what do we know in the f at all? There was a lot of it attention by the media on forced labor done by prisoners. And it was a scandal, as you all know, that IKEA in, um, produced in GDR prisons, but at Deutsche Bahn, nothing was known about forced labor in prison during imprisonment. I mean, there was a general knowledge about the topic, but little was known about the uh, events at uh, the Reichsbahn in the GDR. I have a problem with the lighting here, but I'm going to give my lecture without consulting my notes. The GDR's railroad, the Reichsbahn, was handed over to uh, the state at an early point in time. And the uh, administration was responsible again for restoring the railway system that had been dismantled during the events after the Second World War. One of the first uh, forced labor camps we identified was already established immediately after the Second World War, before the Reichsmann was founded. It was the forced labor camp for um, Erla Brunn, which was established in the Soviet occupation zone. And the task was uh, 
to um, promote the mining activity in the Ore Mountains, and the Soviet military administration wanted to have a, a, a special transport line, and this was a very difficult work, a second track, a railway, a, a, a railway station for goods was supposed to be erected, and a tunnel was needed, and um, workers were missing. And they turned to the justice system of Saxony and instructed forced laborers to be made available for these works. And I'm mentioning this explicitly because it's, a very, it's, it's an early example, but it shows the transition. Let's say there were still the working camps uh, with the prisoners of war, Sachsenhausen was still being used, and now the penal system instructed the deployment of forced laborers to be transported to um, Erlabrunn, and there weren't enough. And this is why the penal system takes over this task to provide prisoners for this camp. So, this is decisive if you take into account how the work done by prisoners will develop later on with regard to the Reichsbahn. So the story continues, but it ends fast. The Deutsche Reichsbahn provides prisoner cars where they are accommodated, and Wismut provides the guards and as food uh, allegedly was quite good, as we know from a letter by a prisoner. There's even a kind of a cultural program, and I'm not cynical by mentioning the fact that the uh, administration of the justice system called this camp uh, progress, gave it the name of progress. So this didn't have anything to do with the Gulag or uh, couldn't be compared to the Nazi work camps. But the whole undertaking didn't really make much sense because the uranium reserves were exhausted soon and the work hadn't been done well enough. So it was basically done a work in vain to build this new line. Later on, there was more work to be carried out uh, in track construction. If we look over the whole period until 1989, we can identify th three stages of how work was done for the Deutsche Reichsbahn. The first uh, phase uh, ends in the mid-60s. Before that, in railway and track construction work is being done. Then there's a second phase during which these mobile workplaces were done away with. In 1966, 1967, this happened. So there was a kind of uh, framework agreement, as we would call it today, or a temporary work agreement between the Ministry of Transport and the Ministry of the Interior. They entered into this agreement, and there was this mutual obligation that they entered into to make available prisoners, a thousand per year. And the Reichsbahn was to make sure that personnel was provided and the um, necessary personnel workers were provided. Then there's a third stage or phase in the 1980s. There were no longer mobile workplaces and uh, this the Brandenburg-Gordon prison is notorious 
And in Cottbus, there wasn't enough space anymore in the penitentiary. So the, uh, at that point in time, there were people who were accused of uh, attempts to desert the Republic and political prisoners were imprisoned here, together with, quote, normal criminals, unquote. The first phase that starts with Ela Brunn continues when the harbor in Karlsbrunn uh, and the transport line is expanded and prisoners were sent from Neustrelitz in particular to contribute to this railroad line expansion which was necessary to provide the north-south line and to compensate for the disassembly that happened after the Second World War. Together with the civilian workers uh, who came from the whole of the Republic, 200 to 300 people were, or workers were deployed there starting in 1961, 1962, more or less. I don't remember exactly when it was. The working conditions of these workers, to the extent to which we know, uh, are very different, but not very different from the civilian workers. There's just one major exception, apart from the fact that they were forced to work there. They don't have the possibility ability to outperform, to exceed the, st the norm. So the foreman always had to, usually had to give the possibility to the workers to outperform the norm or the requirements. That wasn't the case for the prisoners. They were assigned the lesser tasks at the dams or uh, the track construction. So they could not exceed the requirements. And this would have been important in order to benefit from a better food than the one they could buy with the little personal money they received. So this construction work was not never very successful for the Deutsche Reichsbahn because the work wasn't done, was not done flawlessly. We don't know whether that was due to the prison prisoners, uh, but it's a, in general it's a very tough work, a lot of manual work using shovels. Oh, thank you so much. And there wasn't a lot of machinery that could be used. And the reports that there are on the prisoners who were used there is that the foreman had a quite a um, not very strict way of dealing with the workers, let's say. There are reports by the prison authorities stating that they uh, the prisoners got in touch with civilian workers that they exchanged goods, that they could even buy alcohol. And that was necessarily something that infused the penitentiary. So that was the perspective of the prisons and the perspective of the Reichsbahn was that the workers weren't provided in reliable numbers. So that in future projects, they only used the prisoners on an ad hoc basis for the work to be done. In this connection, there was this framework agreement between the two ministries. And the uh, track panel assembly, these are places where larger parts of the tracks were assembled. This is a very difficult and dangerous work. And the 
security measures were not sufficient. So there are many, many reports about injuries, uh, bruises that the workers suffered, to say the least. And this uh, happens. So in Fürstenberg, there are many places where the track panels are assembled, and they were used until the very end of existence of the GDR, and uh, prisoners had to work there until the very end. Then there's a second permanent workplace. The most cruel one, most probably, is in Brandenburg Garden, where there was the um, repair workshop or repair plant of Potsdam. They had a um, disassembly hall there, including a square or a yard where freight cars were repaired amongst other activities. And if you have a look at the regime of imprisonment in Brandenburg Garden, and that is uh, described in Michael Wunschik's work, you can imagine what it meant for the political prisoners who had to work under these conditions. And they had to carry out works, a normal worker in this repair plant would ever have accepted to perform. So exceeding the requirements was 120 days was needed. And the normal workers could achieve up to 400%, could be expected, they could be expected to perform 400% of the normal standard, particularly during the harvest season, because there weren't enough freight cars, and they had to work in night shifts, in, in a three shift system. So you can easily imagine what that meant for young people, the young people who came there. We had um, interviews with contemporary witnesses. We were able to ask them. We were lucky to have the opportunity. And as one thing became evident, as soon as you had someone to protect you, one of the criminal offenders, it was bearable, but if not the nightmare of the situation in the cell continued during that shift work and in turn into a never-ending ordeal. So this situation already describes the last phase of the deployment of forced laborers. As we were able to find out on a yearly average, it was 500 prisoners who worked for the GDR's railway, railway company Reichsbahn. As compared with the overall number of prisoners and political prisoners, and if you imagine the number of prisoners who worked in total, well, we weren't able to find out how many prisoners worked for Deutsche Reichsbahn. We had support from UOKG, for example, posing these interviews and interview partner as our, at our disposal, but we couldn't say what the overall figures of prisoners were was who worked for the railway company as forced laborers. But from a political point of view, it's important to not just ask the former prisoners, but also find former employees of the GDR's railway company who could comment. We made a call in our own internal newsletter and tried to find employees from these times. 
And this was the most interesting time witness, a master craftsman who used uh, to work in Brandenburg as a forced laborer. And he had read uh, the barbed wire magazine of UOKG. So he had read that, and he told us that RAW Potsdam, the repair works, had used him to go to the Brandenburg Garden um, prison and to work there. And he described it just like Dante's Inferno. He very expressively described to us just how the company completely withdrew from any responsibility whatsoever for these forced laborers and that there was no care taken, no precautionary measures taken at all. And it was all left to the prison and to the prison regime to do that. And all they ever did was to put up some stats. And time witnesses confirmed this for the late 1980s. And if we consider what that means for the remembrance politics, then that's truly interesting because to any historian, it is very important to wonder what options people might have had who found themselves in that situation. And we can then state, looking back at the 1980s, that there was quite a lot of indifference and that people were just tolerating the situation as it was, that they were just accepting things as they were, that they were accepting this process because it meant systemic relevance to the state and to the GDR, but it meant that there was no awareness whatsoever for the responsibility involved. And some individual former employees of Reichsbahn were able to tell us about that. So we were able to gather a little bit of an insight into the relationship between the companies and their forced laborers. For Deutsche Bahn, the current German railway company, it is a very important topic, even though Deutsche Bahn is not the legal successor of the GDR's railway company. But after in the year 1994, Deutsche Bahn was founded as a, as a semi-private and semi-public company. It's become a very important task to take a look at the less comfortable sides of the company's legacy. And if um, injustice was done back then, then it is our task to reveal this past. So as a historian working for Deutsche Bahn, I am quite glad to be able to do this work. And I would like to say thanks to the Union of Victims Associations of Communist Tyranny. And I'm happy that we have um, the statement of two witnesses, uh, the testimonials of two witnesses in, uh, the, in a Nuremberg Museum. And as um, someone working at the museum, informing people about the content, there is one exhibition on, uh, on the history of the two railway companies. And people do listen to the interviews that were made with the time witnesses. And for the educators who work there at the exhibition, it is also a f firm part or a fixed constant in their guided tours they give through that museum. So that is quite good. And it's very important to, that we report in the former Western German federal states about what happened in the former GDR. And to conclude, I would also like to follow the assessment of Mr. Wölber, and we just heard the money was earned for Deutsche Reichsbahn through the prison workers. And that was absolutely vital to uphold the GDR system as such, because the GDR's economy depended so heavily on that. There wasn't any prison wear, as it was called, but this never existed because in the internal economic cycle of the GDR, this money remained. 
So it's completely clear that injustice was done in those years. And astonishingly, in our company history, this wasn't even something ever alluded to until we made it public. So I would like to thank you now for your kind attention. I'm very much looking forward to the further conversations with you tonight. Thank you very much. Dear Ms. Kill, thank you very much. So this is us for today. This was quite a lot of information. I think we've not earned our dinner. First of all, let me inform you, to everyone who was watching the live stream, we will continue tomorrow morning at 9.30 a.m. With regard to the headsets, please take your headsets, but do not take the receivers. Um, leave the receivers here and bring the headphones back tomorrow. So if, because unless you do so, or if you don't, then we'll have to pay quite a lot of money tomorrow. So we have prepared some food for you outside. It's going to be great. You will love it. Please make sure you keep your distance and please make sure you wear your face masks as you leave. No, I didn't put it the right way. I'll say it again. It wasn't clear. I wasn't clear. Okay, it's for hygienic reasons, the thing I was just saying about the receivers and the headphones. So the headphones cannot be sanitized. So please take the headphones, but leave the receivers here, because if you take both, it's going to be very expensive for us. So don't. Thank you. Okay. Right, so food is outside. Thank you very much for assisting on this first day. And have a great evening. And one more thing. The bus. Well, so we're back on time. It seems it's just ten a ten minute delay. So the bus will leave to go to the hotel at at nine p.m. So at nine p.m. the bus will take us all back to the hotel. And please ask any of us if you've forgotten the time. Thank you.